Okay. Thank you everyone for joining us. Welcome to today's CNCF live webinar, Growl VM native image, low footprint Java in the cloud. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct and then hand over to Chris Foster, principal product manager at Oracle and Eli Schilling, head of developer relations content at Oracle. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee. There's a chat box on the right hand side of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. And please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They are also available via your registration link you used today, and the recording is available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand it over to Chris and Eli to kick things off and take us through. Yeah, thank you very much. Hi, my name is Chris Foster. I work at Oracle Labs. Um, for the GraVM team. I work in product management, so I create a lot of content and do a lot of talks about GraVM native image. Um, it's a technology some of you may have heard of, I guess, but hopefully in this um, session, we'll go into what GraVM native image is and what some of its benefits are. Okay, so what is GraVM and, and why should I care? This is gonna be a mix of slides and some live stuff, some live coding, um, some deploying things to the cloud. So I'm hoping there won't be too many um, mess ups along the way, but bear with me if there are. So what is GraVM? It's a number of things. It's uh, a Java runtime. So we have JDK 11, JDK 17. You could just think of it as a, a drop in replacement for whatever Java runtime you're using at the moment. And the benefit of it, certainly in the enterprise edition, is that we have a new, an entirely new um, JIT compiler. So it's entirely written in Java. It's very fast, very efficient. And it's got, you know, it, it can make your application significantly faster if you're using the paid enterprise version. We're not going to talk about that today. Another feature, which is the one you may have heard the most about, is native image. This is where we take an application, your application, and generate a native executable from it. And by native executable, I mean uh, a binary that will run natively on whatever platform you're building on. So if you're using a Mac, you end up with a Mac ex binary executable file, a single file that you run and has no dependencies on the JVM. So it's very easy to distribute. It's ideal for containers. So if you're building on Linux and you, you um, package this binary up in a container, you can get a very small uh, Docker container, for instance, with your application in it. So that's going to be the main focus of this talk, but we'll talk about some of the other things that GraVM is before we move on to that. So it's multi-language. We've added um, an API to the, uh, the Java runtime, to, or to the JDK, that lets you run many languages on top of the, uh, the Graal uh, Java runtime. So you can run currently Python, uh, you can run Node.js and JavaScript, you can run R, C, C++, lots of different um, languages. Uh, you can run them natively. There's no sort of cross compilation, so you don't end up uh, basically using some kind of compiler that generates bytecode that then runs. You have an interpreter for the language that you can install into the JVM. Very interesting, but we won't talk about that today. And finally, it's, um, it's an open source project. So we have a free, totally free community edition, and we have an enterprise edition, which is paid for support, basically. There is a number of optimizations, performance optimizations you get with that, but basically it's at the performance plus support. But the community edition, as I said, is, is free to use and is developed in the... Uh, so why should I care? I've covered some of these points already, but really if you're thinking about GraVM as a Java runtime, it's improved performance. If you're thinking about native executables and you want to be able to build these fast starting, low footprint uh, native executables, then the native image part of GraVM is the thing that's interesting to you. And that's what we're focusing on today. The best way to do it, to explain this really, is if I try and show you some examples. So we're going to sort of iteratively build up um, some applications 
and then look at how we turn them into native images, how we deploy them and kind of compare and contrast the kind of the performance we get from our Java version and our native executable. So we need, um, we need a basic app, like a, a model plaything to uh, demonstrate these ideas. So I've got a Java application that uses something called a, a Markov model to generate random text. So I've taken the Jabberwocky poem and then I've wrapped it up in a Java class and I'm using a library, which we'll see in a minute when we look at the code, Rye Data, uh, that lets you generate random text from an original piece of text. So it's, it's a relatively simple application, but it's kind of fun and it um, has you know, various moving parts, which is great. We're going to build it into a Spring application with a REST API that will allow us to call the URL and get back our nonsense verse that resembles the Jabberwocky poem. And as I said, we're going to build initially a Java version of the application, and we're going to look at that now. There's a little note on metrics. Um, in order to uh, compare and contrast like our native application and our Java application, we need to get some figures about performance. And in order to do that, um, I'm using the uh, Spring Framework Actuator, like the Spring Boot Actuator, which gathers statistics and facts about your running application and is able to serve them up on a URL. And then I'm using Prometheus, which is like a time series uh, data engine that lets you grab those, uh, grab, sorry, it, it calls those URLs, uh, those actual screen scrapes like the information from them and stores them in time series. And then at the very end of that, I'm using Grafana to uh, pull this data together to make nice visual um, dashboards, which we'll see in a second. So let's look at the code. So I'm going to jump to my code editor. And here you are. I've got a, uh, I've got my Spring Boot project. Let's take a look at the Java application. It's, it's very, very simple, like I said. Um, we've got a basic Spring Boot um, starter class, like a main class. Uh, we have a utility class, jabberwocky.java, which contains the um, the main logic of our application. Here's the text for the poem, the Jabberwocky I mentioned. We build this uh, Markov model. This is basically just a model of the text, and then we store it in this utility object. This object is created as a singleton, so there should only be one of them running inside our application. And whenever we want some nonsense first, we're going to hit some methods in this class generate or generate with a number of lines that's going to query that model and using a string buffer build up a, a number of lines of text for us and then return that to us so that's our simple that's the functional part of the application and then we need to wrap it in a controller so we have a very simple um, spring controller here it's a rest controller we've given it a url to listen to slash jibber to bind to and we have some methods that let us you know uh, that basically serve the content for that. So if we just call slash jibber, we, we, we get our model and we generate some text and return that. But we can also optionally, you know, ask for a number of lines of text, 10, 100, 200, whatever. So that's our Java application, very simple. We can build it from the command line. So uh, I'm in my terminal on my server. So if I do maven clean package, it's going to build the application, and you'll notice in a second that it also um, builds a, a Docker container with the application in it. I'm using the um, the uh, Spotify Docker Maven plugin to automatically generate um, a Docker container for me, a Docker image from um, a Docker file. So anyway, we've built our application, we've built our container. And if we look in our target directory, surprise, surprise, we've got a jar file. So let's run this. And we're going to put it into the background. And we'll call the URL. And from that uh, benchmark, so the application is starting up. You can see the standard spring output. And yeah, it started up in about two seconds. So now I've. I've got my application running. I can use curl to hit the um, to hit the endpoint, 
And with any luck, I should, if I could type, I should get some uh, nonsense verse back. Brilliant. So we saw some logging there from Spring, but here we have some text that was generated by our custom application. And if I call it again, I get slightly different text back. Beware the Jabberwocky this time. It starts with, uh, what does it start with actually? No, it starts with and as if, and before it was um, starting with, uh, where was my curl? Yeah, and hast thou. So every time I call my URL endpoint, I get a new like nonsense, piece of nonsense verse that's modeled on uh, the Jabberwocky poem. So my application's running. We've got an idea of what it does, and we can see that it, it generates the text that we want to. So I'm going to bring it back into the foreground and kill it. I also said that um, I'm using Maven and the Spotify plugin to generate a container for me um, uh, automatically. So if I call um, Docker images, yeah, I can see that I created a container and I can run that container and that will also um, that will also um, do exactly the same thing. But let's run the container just to show that the, the app is now successfully packaged into my, my Docker image. So I've got to map some ports to make it available locally. I'm just going to copy the name of the repository. It's got a very long repository name. The reason for that will become clear in a second. And then I've tagged, tagged it to describe which version of the app it is. As we go through this, we're going to build um, different versions of the application. Ah, am I already running containers? OK, no. I know what I'll do. We'll call it Jibber JDK1. I'll sort that out in a second. So my application started. So now, if I were to hit curl, I get nonsense text back. Ah, typos. OK, so. We've built our application. We've tested it from the command line. We can run our jar using Java. And we see it starts in about two seconds, uh, returns us our text. We've seen that it's packaged up in a Docker container. Perfect. And we can also, um, we can also quickly look at the size of the jar, et cetera. So this is a little script I've written that generates a bar chart that shows you how big the jar is and how big the JDK container is. So my jar is 21 meg in size, but my um, Docker container containing my Java runtime and my jar and everything else that um, Java needs is about 600 meg in size. So that's not, that's not very slimmed down yet. We could make that smaller using a slimmer container and um, using JLink to build a, a slimmed down JVM. But to my eye, that's you know, there's not a ridiculous size container for a uh, like an application packaged, uh, a Java application packaged as a Docker container. So, about 600 meg for the container, about 20 meg for the application, for the application code. So we're going to switch back to uh, my slides. So we've seen the application. We've seen that it runs, and now we're going to get to the topic of native executables and containers. So we, we talked about some of the benefits of like native image and these native executables previously. But just to recap on that, I mean, why do we want to do this? We want to do it because we want our applications to start faster in containers. And we want them also to have a smaller footprint. By smaller footprint, we can mean a number of different things. One would be the container size. So the less in the container, you know, the, the better. You have to store these, right? The less that's in the container also, arguably, like the more secure the container would be. Faster starting means that, you know, um, you're more likely, you, you may be able to scale to zero and then bring instances up into to handle calls to requests. But it, it means it's easier to scale the application dynamically. Another area of, uh, another area we can talk about the footprint as well is the memory consumption of the application. Obviously, in the cloud, you pay for everything. So if you're using more memory you know, you're, to run your, an instance of your application, the more memory you use, the more expensive it's going to be. So if you can use less memory for the same, um, for the same throughput, the same performance, or very similar performance, then that might be interesting. So 
I've got a little graphic I built here earlier today to talk about, to help people visualize what native image is. On the left, we can see we've got some Java files. What typically happens is you, you compile those with Java C and you get some class files. And then you run those class files. You might package them up in a Docker container, et cetera, but at some point you're gonna say Java class path this or jar this and, and actually call the, the main entry point for that application. And that's what we would call like the JIT way of running your Java code. You take a Java runtime, your class files, and you run the class files on the Java runtime. What we're looking at here is ahead of time um, uh, compilation, which adds another build phase in. So we take the class files, we run a tool called native image against them, and that generates our single native executable, our single binary. So that's AOT or ahead of time compilation. You can do this by hand, you know, you can use the native image tool directly from the command line, but um, you don't need to. Support for that is now, you know, is, has been available in inside Maven and Gradle for quite some time now. The GraalVM team has a native build tools project that um, provides support for Maven and Gradle. There's plugins for Maven, for instance, which we will look at today. And these help you automate the, the process of building your native image. So you don't need to think about that. You add some configuration to your uh, Maven POM file. And from that, you can then automatically generate um, a native executable of your Java application. So two things to think about. You've got the JIT approach to running your application. You're going to have Java in a container and your class files. And then we have this extra build step for ahead of time compilation where we build a native binary and then that is the thing that we deploy, we run, we package. So I'm using a Spring app. So it's probably important to talk about um, the Spring Native projects now. Um, so the Spring Native is uh, an experimental project that's working to um, make using Spring apps and turning them into native executables very easy so that you don't have to do anything. So if you've got a Spring app, sorry, you can add this dependency, add the AOT plugin um, to your POM file, and these plugins and this dependency will automatically solve all of the, the any issues result, uh, related to making the application the spring parts of the application work with GraalVM native image. So for every spring uh, uh, component you use, the AOT plugin is gonna generate required config and a few other things to make that seamlessly work with GraalVM native image. This is gonna be part of Spring Boot 3 very soon. I haven't updated my application to work with that yet, but you know, when, um, it's, when Spring Boot 3 is released, you won't need to add these at all, I don't believe. I think you can just have a Spring Boot 3 application and you will be able to like ask for the application to be packaged as a native executable. I think, I think certainly in Maven uh, using uh, profiles. So we've looked at what native image is. We're gonna jump back to the code. We're gonna have a look at how we take that same application that we just wrote and turn it into a native executable. I'm not going to need to change the application in any way. My Java application is going to stay the same, but I'm just going to change how we build it and deploy it. So if I switch back to my code editor, we'll look at the pom.xml. I'm just going to resize this window. So I've added a profile to the um, pom.xml. And Maven profiles allow you to have specific configurations for build. So in this case, when I type Maven package, I want it to build my jar file, and I want to package that as a Docker container with Java in it. But if I, t if I call the uh, native profile, I want it to package my application as a binary executable for Linux, and I want to package that binary executable into a Docker container. So if we take a quick look at this, uh, Maven profile. We've added a new plugin here. This is the native Maven plugin that I talked about. This simplifies uh, using native image from inside Maven. There's a Gradle plugin as well. It's very easy to fit in. You can pass some configuration. So for instance, I'm using uh, a property in my Maven file to say what the output executable name should be. And we can also, and this is quite important, pass in extra flags to native image with this build arc parameter. 
Um, for instance, I'm asking it, you know, to give full um, exception stack traces if anything goes wrong. Always a handy thing when you're trying to debug something. And I'm also passing in a flag to tell it to create a mostly statically linked executable. Because we're generating um, a binary executable, we have the ability to um, statically link it. What does that mean? It means that any system libraries or any libraries basically that the application needs outside of the JavaScript can be statically linked into the executable. They can become part of the executable. So theoretically, if you build a fully statically linked executable, you can deploy it in a from scratch container, an empty container. The single executable will contain everything you need for it to run. That's today, and that in the libmuscle tool chain, I haven't got that set up on this machine, but a, a nice kind of halfway house is that you can statically link all of the other libraries apart from glibc. So on most Linux um, distros, uh, glibc is the standard C library. It isn't suited to being uh, not to being stat sorry. It isn't suited to being statically linked. Certain parts of it rely on being rely on it being dynamically linked into the application. There are some bugs open on glibc uh, relating to this. So if you use the mostly statically linked executable, you get the, a lot of the benefits. Most of the libraries are baked in, and that also means that you can use a very small um, container image. So in my uh, in my Docker file, I'm going to base that on Distrilus. So I'm going to use a Distrilus container to package my native executable in basically because distrolist contains uh, glibc, but not a lot else, you know, some configuration, et cetera. But it's a very, uh, very minimalist container. The less in the container, the smaller, arguably, the more secure it is, um, you know, the, the fewer things you have in there that can be hacked. So that's the first thing. We're using the native Maven plugin to, to make building the uh, binary executable easy. And again, I'm using this Spotify plugin to package that up as a uh, native executable, so, uh, package that up as a, a Docker container, sorry. So I've written a script to do this, but really all this is doing is just calling Maven, saying correctly, yeah, calling Maven, passing in a, um, a profile and a few um, properties. I want to tag my image differently. I want this one to be called tagged with, so I know this is my native container. That's useful. So when I push to Kubernetes, I can start up an instance of the app that contains the native executable and another instance of the app that's based on the Java container. And I can have them running concurrently in my cluster and, you know, hit them with requests, hit them with requests and then query them to see how they're performing. And I'm also able to specify um, a Docker file. So it's worth having a quick look whilst this is building. You can see that the output from the native image build is shown below. So almost done, stage five or seven. Uh, my native, oh, sorry, that's my Kubernetes. My native uh, Docker file is very simple. I'm basing it on distrolus base. I've got an argument that lets me pass in the name of the executable. I want to load, expose a port, and then I just copy that into uh, copy and rename basically that into the root, and then my entry point is slash app. So I could use this um, Docker file for, you know, running almost any binary application that I want to pass in. So we're just creating the image now. Native image is creating the image below. It's finished. It's been packaged up next in its Docker container. And when that's run, we'll just take a look to see if the Docker container has been built. Great. Okay. So that completed without any error messages. If I do Docker images. Yeah, so there's my native container, Jibber native. So now I've got a native version of the application packaged as a Docker container and a Java version. So I said the first thing it does is build the native executable. So if we look in our target directory, we can see here um, the Jibber application. Oh, sorry. Such a bad typo. There we go. So it is just a binary application. There's not, um, it's, it has no dependency on the JVM at all. 
So let's run that just to see how it um, performs and just to show that it can be run. So I'm going to run that binary executable, put it into the background. So it starts really fast, 0 0.04 seconds. OK, so it's finished um, starting up in 0 0.04 seconds. And I can just hit the endpoint again. Ah, oh, oh, damn. My typing is really poor. Yeah, so we've got our application running as a native executable and returning gibberish text, which is what we want. So it also wasn't very difficult. We needed to change some things. We'll basically add some uh, configuration to our POM file and through the, you know, adding the Spring Native plugins and the GraalVM plugins to our, um, our POM file. Very easily, we, we were able to take this Spring, Spring Boot application and turn it into uh, a native executable. So last time, when we built the Java application, we took a look at the size of the, um, the jar versus the size of the container. And we can do the same um, now with uh, our native executable. So this script returns the size of the jar, 21 meg, the native executable size, which is um, 82 meg, the size of our container with the native executable in, that's the third um, row down, which is 106 meg, and the size of our JDK container. So we can see our native container is significantly, um, already significantly smaller. So that's that's one of the, one way of looking at the footprint, I suppose, of what your application is. How big is its container size? Okay, so we're gonna switch back to the slides. I hope you're all following along. No one's getting seasick with this uh, switching from the editor to the slides. I thought it's probably worth having a bit of a recap again We've built a Java application. We've containerized it. That was easy. Native app and containerized that. That actually wasn't that much more difficult. We've seen that the native application starts really quickly. And we've seen that the containers uh, are smaller. So they, they've got very little in. So now we're going to think about you know, how we might deploy this. Um, um, it's kind of interesting to, to deploy it to Kubernetes so that we can look at these metrics that I talked about at the start. And so we can have a dashboard that like compares and contrasts the application's performance. So we can see if you know using a native exec executable instead of the Java runtime to run our application is a sensible choice. So if we look at this diagram, over on the left, you know, we've got two streams basically. The top, we've got our native executable. We can see the diagram shows that that's turned into a container and then underneath that we've got our class files and we turn that into a container and then we push those to a container registry so i'm using a container registry uh, in oci in the oracle cloud i've also pre-set up um, uh, an oracle container engine cluster so an oke cluster that's just a kubernetes cluster so that kubernetes cluster is going to pull my containers from my container registry and I've pre-deployed to this, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this Kubernetes cluster, Prometheus and Grafana, and I've wired them all up correctly so that we're able to go to the dashboard and those dashboards know how to, you know, uh, extract information, reporting information from the applications deployed to the Kubernetes cluster. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we've got an API that's fronted, like a service that's fronting the, the native version of the REST application. So we can call that and uh, we can get our nonsense text returned from the native version of the containerized application and the same for the Java. And into that cluster, I'm going to deploy some stress testing uh, cron jobs that are going to hit both of those endpoints continuously so that the applications will be running under load. And when they're running under load, that's going to help us look at the, the metrics that we get on, Grafana, on our Grafana dashboard at the end. Um, and that will help us understand you know, what the trade-offs are, whether it makes sense to run the application as a native application or as a Java runtime, or top of a Java runtime. There's a quick note on um, the stress testing the apps. When, when stress testing the apps, it's important to try and keep things um, fair. So the Java application, 
um, in my Kubernetes description for deploying the application. I'm fixing the memory. I'm giving it 256 meg, but I'm allowing it to creep up to 512. The native application, I'm fixing its memory at 128 meg and not allowing it to increase. And I'm giving the Java application and the native application two cores to work with. So I'm trying to keep things fair. I'm giving the native application a handicap and giving it much less memory. But I kind of want to, to like, you know, the um, native image can run with a smaller memory footprint. And finally, I'm using a tool called Hey to um, do the stress testing of both of the applications. So we're going to jump back to um, my brow uh, to my editor, code editor, and terminal, and we're going to look at deploying the scripts, look at the scripts that deploy the application, push the containers, and um, deploy my application to my Kubernetes cluster. So I'm going to just kick off the script that um, pushes the containers. I've done this earlier, so probably it's going to say that they're already there. So if I look at the push scripts, not really doing a great deal, Docker push to my uh, OCI repository. And then I'm going to look at the deploy script. So uh, the way I've written this application, in the queue, I wanted it people to be able to clone it and use their own repository so the solution i've i've used is to put a template in for the um the container registry repo name so that allows you to set this environment variable and um you know for, for your own container registry so your container registry isn't going to be the same as mine if you're deploying it to cloud x you know oracle cloud aws whatever and then I've used um, M, the msubs command to replace those templated uh, repository names with the real name, which exists as an environment variable, and then pipe that into kube control. So let me just check before I run this that my repo path variable exists. Yeah, OK, cool. So I can deploy my application to the cloud. Now, this is going to deploy the Java application. So first, it's creating a namespace to deploy everything to. That already exists. It's then deploying the um, Java version, of, along with the service to front it, the native version, and the same for that. And in my Kubernetes description, I can quickly show you these. That, that there's nothing, you know, very exciting in here. I've uh, basically created a specification for the deployment. I have given it a name, my re my container. So this is going to use my open JDK version of the app container. I've constrained the memory like we talked about, and I'm opening up a port. And then I'm also opening up the um, uh, the endpoint, the 8080 endpoint to the outside world. And I'm using um, the annotations from OCI, the load balancer annotations, to automatically open up a to automatically, sorry, spin up a load balancer for me, which will handle incoming traffic. And I've done the same for exactly the same for the native image. The only difference here is that I've constrained the memory. Sorry, I can put it at 128, but I'm allowing it to creep up to 256. So we've deployed the application. We really want to see if my app's up and running. So I can use kube control uh, to get my services in my namespace. This namespace contains just the versions of my applications. So my Java application and my native image application. You can see that there's three rows there rather than the two I've been talking about because I've already deployed um, an enterprise, GraalVM enterprise version of the application. Um, if I was going to talk about you know, the JIT performance, that would be interesting, but I'm not. So let's, let's hit that endpoint for the native version, the public endpoint for the native version. So I'm going to take the IP address for my load balancer that's fronting out the, um, the native executable, and I can call it, and I get some text back. And I can do the same as well for the, the Java version, except I've got rid of my IP addresses. No, let's do that again.
So this one's going to hit the, uh, the load balancer for the Java version application. Yeah, 8080, and we should get some nonsense first back. Brilliant. So we know our applications are up and running. I've also set up a, a namespace. You know, I said that I had pre-configured um, uh, Kubernetes. Sorry, in Kubernetes, I'd already pre-configured Prometheus and uh, Grafana so that I would have a way of grabbing uh, information about the running applications and displaying it in a dashboard. So I've got my my URL here for my Grafana instance. And if I jump to uh, the web browser, oh, I've already got it open. So let's run it and take a look at this dashboard. So there are three components to this dashboard and I should explain what they do. So the first one is measuring the throughput and it's measuring the throughput of the, the native executable running inside uh, a container that's in, that we deployed to my Kubernetes cluster and also the uh, performance of the Java version of the application, the throughput, I should say, of the Java application running in a container. So I've got two containers, my native one and my Java version of the application and I'm hitting both of those concurrently with um, a stress test request. So I'm hitting the URL for the Jibber app, Jibber endpoint and asking for nonsense first continuously. So both apps are under load and we can see that basically they've got very similar performance. The yellow line on the top graph, the throughput graph, which is in numbers of requests per second, is um, the native images throughput. So the native executable is slightly, on average, slightly better than the um, version of the application running on OpenJDK. But we're getting, it looks to me, like roughly about 770 requests per second have been served by either application. Your mileage may vary with this. Obviously, you know, your performance uh, will depend on what the application is doing. Some applications, native image may, the native executable will perform exactly the same. Some applications, it might perform slightly better. Other applications, it might perform slightly worse. But we're aiming to get the performance of the native executable that's generated with native image up to and approaching the same performance that you would get on OpenJDK. We've got some optimization tools that can really push the performance there. Won't have time to talk about those in depth in this talk, but I'll mention them a little at the end. So key thing about the top graph, we're getting very similar um, performance. In fact, slightly better for native image. The next graph down Sorry, is the... Chris, maybe... If I could interject really quick, we have a yes, question. In the, we have a question in the chat. Uh, now might be a good time to kind of to work this answer in. Are there any gotchas to be aware of, given all of the improvements, uh, i.e., reduction in size of the the jar and the JDK? Yes, there definitely there definitely are, and that's what the Spring Native um, tooling is kind of trying is hiding from you. So I, I tell you what I'll do, Eli. I'll finish talking about this graph, and then I'll I'll, I'll talk about that topic actually i might actually just talk about that at the end because i've only got a couple of slides to go but i think that's a very important point so um the so it's a very good question thank you for asking it so the next graph down is the uh the container memory so how much memory resident set size is each container using and in this case really it would have been ideal if i'd have kept the same colors for the same containers but i, I haven't i've just noticed the uh, GraVM native executable is in green, and that's using about 100, yeah, it's slightly over 100 meg, 116 meg, um, in re 115 meg in resident set size. The Java application is using 238. So we're using half the memory for very similar performance. Um, the final uh, graph is the startup times. Well, we knew that they, you know, native, the native executable would start much faster because we'd seen that when we looked at the command line. But this information, again, has been pulled from like, the Spring Actuator. So 35 milliseconds for um, the, the GraVM native executable to start up and the Java application, you know, two to three seconds to start up. So realistic times for the Spring application really you know, what we would expect for a Java Spring application to start up in, you know, second time spans, one to two to three. And the native executable is starting up in, you know, significantly under, you know, a tenth of a second. 
So I'm going to quickly jump back to the slides. Again, you know, this is just what I've shown you. The, the different ways we can look at the footprint, container footprint, you know, the container's got smaller, but we can also think about like the memory usage in the cloud when we've deployed that application. In this example, again, your mileage may vary. Um, we got the same performance for half the memory. And it wasn't that difficult to make native executable from the application. So this is just one example. I think that's a key takeaway. You know, low footprint, if you're interested in low footprint, native images is, is definitely an interesting technology and can provide that for you. If you have long running applications, you know, days, months, years, um, uh, the GraalVM Enterprise Edition JVM would probably make sense because you've got the JIT compiler in there and, and its performance is going to be very, very good. So very long running applications where you, you don't care about the footprint so much. Perhaps, you know, a traditional JIT mode would make sense. We've got different, uh, we support different garbage collection, um, uh, garbage collectors, I suppose you'd say, inside native image. Uh, in the Enterprise Edition, you can have Epsilon, Serial, GC and G1. G1 is our implementation of the G1 GC in Java. Uh, throughput, if you really care about performance with native image, you can use G1 to um, ensure you get consistent latencies in responses. There's no stop the world pauses that you can see with our serial GC. Uh, PGO, our profile guided optimizations. Uh, with that, you can really um, improve the throughput and performance of the application like drastically. We talked a bit about static linking, and finally, it's supported by you know lots of different frameworks. Spring Native, that's what I'm showing you here, but Micronaut, um, which is an independent project, Heladon from Oracle, and Quarkus from Red Hat. All of these target uh, GraalVM native image as a deployment target. They want to build a native executable that starts fast and has a low footprint as a way of packaging their applications. So gotchas, I'll go back to the question that Eli asked. I think it's a very important question. Um, yes, there are. Native image, in order to get a lot, a lot of these benefits, native image makes certain assumptions. It operates under what's called the closed world assumption. So um, in a Java is a very dynamic language. You can load classes um, in your application. You can build up the name of the class, you know, programmatically. You can load resources off the class bar. There's all kinds of, you can do reflection. You can find out about, oops, oh, sorry. You can find out about the methods an object has or, you know, what objects are available in a package, for instance, all sorts of things. It's a very dynamic language. Native image comes at, the, comes at this with the assumption that it's a closed world. Imagine that you can't do any of those dynamic things. You can't load classes, you know, dynamically. You can't use reflection, etc. You would think that you wouldn't really be able to generate many Java applications. But um, it turns out that you can. And the way we've been able to do that is through um, making, being able to tell basically the build time for native image about like these dynamic features of the language. Say for instance, your, uh, your Java program uses reflection to look up a certain class and to find out what methods are available. Well, if we know that that's gonna happen, we can build configuration files that tell native image that this is gonna happen. So, when it builds, it knows that it happens. It knows it can add that class that's going to be accessed reflectively to like the closed world that it's operating on. Um, same goes for class loading, you know, or uh, loading resources off the class path. And that sounds like it might be a kind of a laborious process to build all this configuration for yourself. But we um, we have a Java agent, so when you run your application. Um, you, you run it as a Java application. You can pass, uh, you can run it with this Java, the native image Java agent that basically traces your application, looks for instances of, you know, uh, reflection, um, you know, dynamic class loading, any, anything like that, uh, serialization. And it saves the configuration that you would have had to write by hand automatically, directly to these configuration files. Then when you build, these configuration files um, are used to provide this kind of missing information to native image. Lots of libraries are packaging this information directly with the, the jar for the, um, the library. So, that, I mean, that's kind of what the, the Spring Native stuff is doing. It's providing this missing um, configuration to you. So when you run the application, there's a step where the Spring Native um, 
plugin looks at the application, looks at the class path, looks at what's going on and builds extra classes and extra configuration that your application will need, the Spring application will need in order to be turned into like a native executable. So there's lots of tooling that's been put in place, certainly in the frameworks that I mentioned previously, Spring, uh, Spring Boot, sorry, uh, Micronaut, Helizon and Quarkus to make this like as easy as possible. If you're using a library that isn't, you know, native image friendly yet, you may have to resolve some of these issues, you know, by using the Java agent to generate the config for you. And you can get applications to work that, you know, maybe use libraries that use a lot of reflection. So I'm going to see if there are other questions in the chat. So that was a good question. Yes, the gotchas. I mean, if anyone has any further questions, you know, please feel free to ask. And Eli, I'll go back to my slide because it's better to look at really than this. If you want to read out if anyone has any questions. If not, thank you very much for your time today attending. I hope um, I hope it made sense what I was talking about. And, you know, the slides will be available. All the code is available in a, a repository on GitHub as well if you want to play with it. Um, and if there are any errors or, you know, sharp edges, please feel free to make a PR. I would be very grateful. Yes. Anyone else, any questions? <clears throat> All right. Well, Chris and Eli, thank you both so much. Thanks for a great no presentation. Um, and everyone, thanks for joining us. Like Chris said, this will be posted to the website via your registration link, also on the CNCF YouTube uh, playlist for online programs. And up, oh, there's one more question. We'll hang tight. Are there any frameworks or spring modules that are known to be unsupported? Uh, at the moment, I'm not entirely sure. You if you go to the spring native um, site, for instance, I think there's documentation on there that, if, why don't we do that? Let's just. So this is the documentation for the Spring Native site, uh, for the Spring Native project, sorry. It, it's pretty good documentation. It's worth looking through because it can explain in detail how to use um, how to use this and how to build native images. I thought there was a list of um, things that are known to be supported. The other thing you can do, uh, here, yeah, here we go. So these things require no special build configuration. They will just work. I, I guess that's what they're saying. You know, JPA, for instance, data JPA, like Neo4j, Mongo, um, logging, JDBC. So there's lots and lots of things that are known to be working. I'm sure that if there are things that aren't working, that's also documented somewhere. Uh, I typically also go to um, the Spring Native repo. And in the samples um, project, there's a quite an exhaustive list of um, sample project uh, samples that are known to work. So for instance, if you're interested in Kafka, Kafka streams, rabbit MQ, you could let's take this one, you could go into there and there should be a working project that shows you how to um, use that particular spring module um uh with uh native with native image that is to, meaning to generate like a native executable i hope that answers the question i think i probably answered that in quite a long-winded way sorry that's great all right last call for anyone else No, I think we're good, right? All right. I think so. I'm All right. Well, down. thank you both again so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, everything will get posted shortly, and we'll see you next time for another live webinar with CNCF.